speakers, all of whom are noted experts in their respective fields. Our first speaker is Professor Hattie Syme, who is Professor of Veterinary Internal Medicine at the Royal Vet College. She has a special interest in the kidney and has won awards for her work on kidney disease. And she's going to talk to us about veterinary aspects of the disease. Then Dr. Bruce Catanac will talk. Of course, he's very well known to you. He spent almost all his life in boxers. But he has also, in his professional life, he was director of the Medical Research Council Mammalian Genetics Unit and has an outstanding record in genetics. So there's nobody better qualified to talk about the genetics of juvenile kidney disease. Then Professor Bill Amos will speak on the hunt for the gene. Now Bill is Professor of Evolutionary Genetics in the University of Cambridge. He has many scientific interests. He's got very original ideas and he's fitting with ideas. And we're very lucky that he took an interest in JKD and can give us his perspective. So without, and then following the talk, we're going to have a break for tea and then there will be a discussion session. So without further ado, uh, hand over to Nigel now. Next, the other one. That's one. Yeah. Are you putting your mic on, Hattie? Yes. Good. Okay, can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Excellent. Um, so my name's Hattie. I'm going to talk about some of the medical aspects of kidney disease. Um, I've shamelessly stolen pictures of boxes from the internet, so if, if one of yours comes up, I'm sorry. Because <laughs> uh, I don't have a boxer myself. Um, so, and also what I'm going to try and do is outline some of, some of the ways that kidney disease may come about and try and explain a little bit about what the kidney does. I'm going to do this at a very basic level. So if you have a medical background, if you have understanding of kidney disease, excuse me if I'm patronising to you, that's not my intention. I'm just trying to explain things at, at a level that hopefully everybody can understand. Um, so what I want to do is just briefly to talk about what the kidneys do and what happens when they fail, um, then to mention a little bit about how we tend to test for kidney disease, and then outline what evidence that we've got that there's a problem in boxes, and then talk about whether this is one disease or many, many different types of disease. So what do the kidneys do? Well, the kidneys, as you probably all know, they remove all the waste products from the blood. So all the time, the, uh, the guts are absorbing all sorts of nutrition, but also lots of junk as well that the body then needs to get rid of. The, the products of metabolism, all sorts of waste products are being produced all the time, and the body needs a way of eliminating those. And although the liver does that, in some part, the kidney is the main route of excretion from the body. Uh, the kidneys are also responsible for controlling the levels of uh, fluid and electrolyte, or the different types of salts within the blood. And because of this role, they also have a function in controlling blood pressure. Um, they produce various different types of hormones that control some of the, some of the mineral levels, so calcium and phosphate, but also hormones that control production of red blood cells. So if a patient has kidney disease, they, they often develop a mild anemia as a result, and of course, lots more. Um, so how does, how does this happen? How does this come about? So this is, this is a diagram of a dog's kidney, and ultimately the kidneys produce urine, and the urine goes from the kidney down the ureter to the bladder, where it's then held before elimination. And the kidneys have a massive blood supply. So you've got this arterial supply, and the kidneys receive about 20 to 25% of the heart, the, of the blood that's pumped out of the heart, which is pretty amazing when actually the kidneys only weigh about half a percent of, of the patient. So they get something like 30 times as much blood as muscle does. Um, 
and they need that to be able to form their, uh, perform their sort of filtration function. Now, if you look at the kidneys and you look in, in more detail at this section, what you have is a little duct, which is where the urine comes out and into the renal pelvis. And this duct has numerous um, nephrons leading into it. Now, nephrons are what we're going to talk about next. Nephrons are the individual functioning units of the kidney. So this is the same diagram at rate of magnification. The, the nephrons, of which there are several feeding into each of these ducts, um, and each uh, boxer dog would be expected to have 300, 400,000 nephrons in each kidney. So there are lots and lots of these individual units. They have um, a complex arrangement of blood vessels overlying it. And what I'm going to do now is nephron structure and function is really complex. So why I'm going to break it down to a, to a very superficial level, and instead of talking about all the individual components of the nephron, we're just going to say, okay, eventually the nephrons feed into the collecting duct, and you have multiple nephrons feeding into each duct. But at its most basic level, a nephron consists of the glomerulus, which is the filter, and the tubules. And we're going to look at what each of these does in turn. I'm not quite sure why I'm supposed to be pointing this out. Okay, so the glomerulus, this is, this is in effect a sieve. Um, and the way that the, the, the kidney works is basically the blood gets sieved and small molecules can pass freely through that sieve. But blood cells and large proteins and things don't get through the holes in the sieve and remain within the bloodstream. Then the fluid and the small molecules that have passed through the sieve get reabsorbed by the tubules. And then eventually urine is produced. So this sieving process, so it's basically on the basis of size. There's a little bit of charge comes into it as well. But cells, which are large, and proteins, which are moderately sized, get retained and don't get through this filter, but you've got an awful lot of water and a lot of small molecules that, that, that pass through this, this barrier. And the amount of this filtrate that's formed is massive. So if you, if you think that, actually, I said 20-25% of the, heart, the blood pumped by the heart actually goes to the kidneys, and then about 20% of that actually passes through the filter. There is a limit, because if too much passed through, basically you'd have treacle left in your, in your blood vessels. So uh, about 20% of it passes through. And that means that a human filters about 150 litres a day, um, or your average boxer, about 100 litres per day. So if you think of an oil drum, those, those hold about um, 40 gallons, so it's a, or 200 litres, so it's about half of an oil drum of fluid. Um, but almost all of this then gets reabsorbed. and it gets reabsorbed in the tubule. So, so you've got your glomerulus, your blood vessel, that allows the small molecules through into the tubule. And then if we look at the tubule in, in a magnified view, then what the body does is selectively chooses what it wants to take back up. So things like glucose, sugars and things which are going to be useful for the body, those get reabsorbed from the filtrate and get taken back up into the blood. Now it sort of seems like this is kind of an inefficient system. So you, 
throw everything out, and then you reabsorb, at least for the fluids, you reabsorb 99% of what you've thrown, thrown out. But the advantage of this system is it means that, you know, there might be thousands of different molecules that the body is producing all the time. You can't have a specific way of getting rid of everything that you don't need. It's actually much easier to throw everything out and then take back what, what the body needs. And that's, that's the process by which the kidney works. Does that make, does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. Um, so, and then the final part is in the collecting duct, well, a little bit of this happens in the tubules as well. A little bit of fluid gets reabsorbed through the tubules, but then in the collecting <coughs> duct, lots and lots of fluid gets gets absorbed. So although lots of fluid gets filtered, 99% of it gets reabsorbed, re and so the final volume of urine is relatively small compared to what was filtered. So if we think about what happens when the kidney fails, so now we've got all these individual nephrons, and actually you know, the dog might have half a million of them, but I've just represented a few on this diagram. Basically, what happens in kidney disease, no matter what kidney disease, eventually when the kidney is failing, however the process started, you have loss of lots of those, lots of those individual nephrons. So you've just got a few functioning nephrons left. And usually we say that you have to lose about three quarters of the nephrons before you can detect that with conventional blood tests. So unfortunately, you, there's an awful lot of function that's lost before you can detect it in the blood. And people, especially people who are trying to sell you lab tests, tend to say, oh, well, that's because this lab test isn't very good, or that lab test isn't very good. But actually, part of the reason that it's difficult to detect that you've got a kidney problem is actually, the, up until a certain point, the nephrons that are remaining, the ones that are still working, actually become super nephrons. So they get a little bit bigger, they work a little bit harder, and they filter a little bit more. So there's some compensation for the fact that other nephrons have, have died. So as filtration of the blood reduces because you've got loss of nephrons, then basically things that would normally be eliminated in the body get uh, accumulate in the blood. So they are present at higher concentrations. And some of these are the things that are toxic and will make a patient with chronic kidney disease feel unwell when they accumulate to high levels. And some of them are used as markers for this patient has kidney disease. So the ones that you are likely to have heard about are creatinine, which is the one that is probably the one that we use most, most often. And urea, which is sometimes also called BUN, that's a sort of Americanism for it. And then there's a newer test called SDMA, which, which sometimes people are say, oh, SDMA is better test, and blah, blah. It's, they're basically measures of the same thing. They are measures of this process of filtration. And when the filtration process fails, these substances accumulate in the blood. So although there may be small differences between them, they're essentially measuring the same function, and none of them are going to have great advantages one over the other. And often the differences are basically if you if you if you want to make a test more sensitive, you just make your cutoff lower. So then you're going to get more dogs that test abnormal, but they may or may not have the disease. So you may have an increase in sensitivity of your test, but with a reduction in specificity. Um, yeah, so the, the remaining nephrons do compensate a little bit. They get bigger. The glomerulus actually gets stretched, and it also 
um, functions at higher pressure. And if you've got higher pressure within these blood vessels, a little bit more protein will get squeezed through the, the filter, and so you may get a little bit more protein in your urine. Um, and the other thing that happens is as the kidneys start to fail you get more dilute urine produced and that that seems very um, counterintuitive so if the kidneys are failing why do you produce more urine not less urine but the reason for that is because even though less is being filtered Remember, usually 99% of what's filtered is reabsorbed by the kidney. And when you've only got a few remaining nephrons, they're less effective at reabsorbing stuff. And so now, instead of being able to reabsorb 99% of what was filtered, if they can only reabsorb 97% or 95%, then actually four times as much urine ends up being produced. So that's why there's production of more but more dilute urine. <laughs> um, so what evidence do we have of um, kidney disease in um, kidney disease in boxes? Well, there are there have always been a sort of uh, sporadic case report. So case reports are things that are written up in the literature, in the scientific literature, where somebody describes an individual case or a small number of cases that are well characterised. So somebody's done a lot of testing on them, they've, they've sent samples to the pathologist, and they've identified something that hasn't been described before. So there had been sporadic descriptions of boxes with kidney disease. And then somebody called Marge Chandler, when she was up at um, University of Edinburgh, contacted me, contacted people at the other vet schools, and said, can we, uh, I'd like to put a case series together. Can you send me the, the details of any boxes you've seen in the last five years with kidney disease? And we somewhat arbitrarily decided that we would include boxes that were less than five years. Because, because boxes, just like every other breed, you know, there is some kidney disease that happens with ageing and just by the by. I mean, it's, there are lots of different types of kidney disease. So what we were trying to do was to skew it towards younger animals, which were more likely to have uh, a, a congenital or a familial form of the disease. And so included in the group we had boxes from four months to five years. So things that were, I think, interesting was that there was a preponderance of females in the series that we put together. Um, and that quite a few of these dogs presented, they had a history of incontinence or of urinary tract infection. And those, as well as kidney disease. And this is, this is one of the things where it's a real chicken and egg because patients with incontinence are more likely to get urinary tract infections. If they, can't, if, they can't, if they don't have a very good sphincter to retain urine in their bladder appropriately and urine can, in effect, leak out, then at times it's probably also leaking in the opposite direction or taking taking urine from near the outside, near the vulva, which is not a sterile place, and washing bacteria into the bladder with it. So patients with incontinence are predisposed to urinary tract infections, but also we will see some dogs that maybe they don't have the strongest sphincter in the world, but they're fine until they get an infection, and then they'll present with incontinence. And in addition, uh, urinary tract infections, although most urinary tract infections, when they're located in the bladder, they don't cause a problem to the kidney, they can 
go up the ureters into the kidney itself and cause an infection there, and they can actually be a cause of kidney disease. Um, but does, kidneys that are already diseased are more vulnerable to this actually happening. So everything sort of can occur in different, in different orders. Um, and actually, so the ultrasound changes, uh, so most of the dogs were ultrasounded, examined by that. They had lots of changes, but they were very non-specific. So a diseased kidney doesn't have the beautiful sort of kidney architecture that we would expect, but it doesn't tell you what made that kidney disease. It just tells you that disease is there. And the, there was pathology performed in only about nine dogs, uh, or only nine dogs. It was very non-specific, the results. And certainly when renal diseases advance, when kidney diseases advance, what you end up seeing, especially if you do a sort of needle biopsy, so a very small sample, you end up with scar tissue that says, okay, this is a diseased kidney, but it doesn't necessarily tell you what, what started the whole process. Okay, so another paper that has been published um, is a study from Sweden, and in Sweden, the, there, is a, there is a requirement to have your dog insured. So actually, something like 70% of the population are insured. Well, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. I'm really struggling to hear you, because it's so noisy next door, and I wonder if somebody could just sneak in and just ask for this I can, because um, it's just really difficult to hear you. Perhaps you can try to Does that go up? Yeah, or I, or I, I can try and speak out loud, but I didn't realise I was, I was speaking so Right. And is anybody else having a difficulty? If, if, if you're not, please, please. Three seats down here. Four seats down here. But also, if you're losing me, just, just wave and I'll try and speak up. Sorry. <laughs> So the, so the other s study that has been published was looking at dogs in Sweden. So in Sweden it's required that your dog has insurance at least up until the age of 10. And a lot of people are insured with just one major insurance company, which means that they've been able to look at insurance records and get lots of information about what diseases different breeds of dogs get and what, um, so what diseases they have and what diseases they eventually die of. And looking at kidney disease in the, in the Swedish boxer population, or in Swedish dogs overall, boxers came out as number three in terms of having kidney disease and number four in terms of dogs actually dying of their kidney disease. Um, now, the limitation is that these vets, these dogs were seen by vets in general practice, and so you know the vet wrote on the record that the dog had kidney disease. We have no idea of how how detailed that diagnosis was, whether that was more their suspicion or if they've proven it with blood tests or anything like that. Um, but nonetheless, the boxer did feature in that. Um, and what they found was that um, if you assume that the dogs had a 10 year lifespan, then 1.6% of the dog population as a whole develop kidney disease over 10 years, and 3.6% of the boxers. So sort of more than twice that of the general population Still not, still not every boxer gets kidney disease, mercifully, but, uh, but more than the general population, and 2.3% of them died of the disease. Now, as a comparator, um, I'm sure you're, that you're very well versed on heart disease in boxers and things like that. Looking at the same, the same database of dogs in Sweden, 
then the prevalence of heart disease was 4.6%, so about twice what they had of kidney disease. Um, but I know that you all know that heart disease is you know, an, a, an important problem, and in spite of that, because these numbers can look quite small, that, that's still 4.6% of the dogs, and, and it's 2.3% that have kidney disease. Again, and this is a recurring theme, it seems to be more common in the females than the males. And the average age of death of, due to kidney disease in the boxes was five years, but there was a big spread. Um, so what are some of the specific causes that have been described of kidney disease in boxes? Was frustratingly, so there are very few that have had very good pathological examination. So a complete pathological examination would be when a patient's died and you have a pathologist that both examines the body but also takes the kidney and looks at it under the microscope and tries to determine what the characteristics of the underlying disease were. One of the terms that is described is something called renal dysplasia. Now, renal dysplasia, when, when an animal is born, the kidneys aren't actually fully developed. In the first few weeks of life, the kidneys continue to develop. And the kidneys, those structures that we were talking about, the glomerulus and the tubules, look different. They look immature in a fetus compared to a patient that is adult. And the characteristic of renal dysplasia is that you still have these fetal or sort of um, baby glomerulus and, uh, and nephrons in an adult animal that should have, should, where they should have matured. The problem about renal dysplasia, the term renal dysplasia, is a lot of people, and that even at a relatively specialist level in the veterinary community don't really understand this term and don't really understand what it means. So at its best, this is a very specific entity, but it tends to get bandied around and especially images, so ultrasonographers and things, think this term means a young dog with bad looking kidneys. And so a lot of people say, oh yeah, it's got dysplasia. And I'm like, okay, and what does dysplasia look like under the microscope? Or they have no idea. It's just a term that's applied. And um, that makes it unfortunate in terms of actually trying to understand what, what they really have. And with the ultrasound, you can really only say, this is a pretty naked looking kidney that doesn't have the beautiful structures that it should have. You cannot make a microscopic diagnosis with your ultrasound. The other thing that has been described, and actually this was a better characterised paper, again uh, a group in Scandinavia described this, and they described dogs as having what they call the ask up kidney or reflux nephropathy. And what this is, and this is, this is a diagram of a human anatomy, so Humans have a slightly different arrangement of their, in their renal pelvis. But in a normal human, when your, when your bladder fills, then actually that acts as a sort of stop valve to stop urine going back up the ureter into the kidney. And what happens in this disease is that this valve is somehow defective and that defective valve doesn't cause a problem in the kidneys in itself, but what it means is that if this patient has an, a urinary tract infection, then infection is more likely to course up the ureter into the kidney, and you get a sort of characteristic pattern of scarring within the kidney, which is very suggestive for this. But it's it's difficult because this is actually diagnosed in people by getting you to pee on, on video camera um, and to actually show 
with with a, a radio marker and, and to actually show that the urine is doing this, which has never been never been done in in dogs. But the, the the some of the dogs do have this sort of characteristic pattern of scarring. Okay, how am I doing for time? Are you about to? Okay, should be okay. Um, as long as you haven't got too many questions, but we've got lots of time for questions at the end. I understand. Okay, so the. So one of the things that comes up is to think about when we're talking about renal disease in boxes or kidney disease in boxes, is this, is this one disease or many diseases? If you think of a different example and you've got a lame boxer like this one stolen from the internet, um, they, it's easy to appreciate that this lame boxer might be carrying its leg, it, there might be all sorts of different problems. It might have dislocated its hip, it might have a, a nail in its paw, it, it, it could have a fracture, it probably doesn't have a fracture, hopefully it hasn't got a bone tumour, um, or it could have ruptured its cruciate, so the, the, the ligament in its knee. That's, that would be my favoured hypothesis for this, for this boxer. Now, we think that cruciate disease, there's probably a genetic component to that because there are certain breeds that do it and because dogs that do it quite often do both of their knees, one after the other. So there's probably a genetic component to it. But if you try to find the gene for cruciate disease and you just took all lame dogs, you'd really struggle because you've got an assortment of everything in there. Um, you've got to be pretty comfortable that you've that you're looking at dogs that have just got cruciate disease before you start searching for the gene. So if we think about kidney disease and we've got our sick boxer with failing kidneys, then we essentially have the same problem because we can look at the dog and we can say, okay, these kidneys are failing, but they could be failing for a number of different reasons. So the, there are a few things that, that, we, that we might see. So we've got pyelonephritis. Pyelonephritis is a posh word that means you've got an infection that has spread from the bladder up into the kidney. Pyelonephritis is a difficult one because that can happen spontaneously or it can happen just bad luck because you had a, a bladder infection and it rose up, or like I was showing with the abnormal valves, you could have a patient that was genetically predisposed and was more likely to get pyelonephritis as a result of that faulty anatomy. You can get glomerulonephritis. Now glomerulonephritis is a disease, an immune mediated disease where the body attacks itself where the patient develops um, a, a, a disease. Sometimes it's triggered by something else, sometimes it's triggered by an infection, and sometimes we can't find any underlying trigger, and it seems to be idiopathic. Now, generally, this presents in a slightly different way. Because the immune complexes, because they're particularly in the glomerulus, that's the sieve, I was telling you about. Basically the holes in the sieve get much bigger and lots and lots of protein leaks out into the urine. So usually we can we get an indication that it's more likely to be an immune mediated disease because the patient has massive amounts of protein in the urine. We obviously we get old dog chronic kidney disease, just like we get old human kidney disease, There's, that, that's set, certainly going to happen. And then you get things that typically present in a more acute manner, so in a patient that was fine one day, really ill the next, so you get things like toxins, I've just put up as an example that dogs can get acute kidney injury from eating grapes or raisins, or from, from drugs, and this is this is one of the things where you can have problems when vets make diagnosis of kidney disease on the basis of blood tests. They can be mistaken sometimes if, 
say the patient's taking lots of diuretics or water tablets, because if the patient's very dehydrated, that can make the kidney values go up. And so there can be misdiagnosis of kidney disease on that basis. <coughs> and then, obviously, there are some genetic causes of kidney disease. Now, the example I've put here, polycystic kidney disease, is not that's one that is definitely not what the boxes have. Um, this, I put this as an example because this is what Persian cats have. And the advantage of this disease is that it's really, really characteristic. You can do an ultrasound and you can see the fluid-filled cyst in the kidney and you can say, ah, that's what the patient has. So with the cats, with the Persians, even before they developed a genetic test, they were able to do ultrasound screening, identify patients that were affected, and not use them in their breeding programs. Um, but certainly uh, genetics, so some genetic tests are very, genetic um, diseases are very characteristic, and others may not be. So, so this is Hattie's wish list for what we need uh, going forward. I think we, we do need better characterization of the problem that we're dealing with and to ensure that it's only a single disease. Now, I mean, boxes as a whole, you know, there will always be dogs that are getting, there are all sorts of different kidney diseases. I, I'm, I'm pretty confident that there is, there is a genetic, boxer kidney disease, there might be more than one, um, but in terms of trying to find that gene, it's obviously going to be easier if you've got a purer population where all the patients that are affected have the genetic form of the disease and you've weeded out everything that's got kidney disease for some other reason. And ideally to do that you'd have specialist histopathology, um, well I guess that's not ideal because the dog is either dead or having a very expensive diagnostic test, but in terms of characterising the disease, that would be a step forward, and I'm going to tell you something about that in a moment. Um, and although, although I say that we we need this, and this is this is the conventional or the better trodden path in terms of identifying disease, there certainly are situations where. A disease has been identified, maybe not that well characterised, but they've been able to find the gene and have then also worked in the opposite direction and said, okay, this gene, we know it causes it causes a problem in these patients. Now, there are other patients that also have this gene. <coughs> Let's start looking at them, and lo and behold, actually some of those animals also have a disease but it's mild enough that it wouldn't otherwise have been recognised. So it is possible to work in both directions. In terms of better characterisation of the kidney disease, there is somebody at the Ohio State University that's got a grant from the American Kennel Club to study the disease in boxes. And what, what she is able to provide is analysis of the renal biopsy. She's not going to pay for the biopsy to be collected, but in terms of the analysis, actually renal histopathology, which includes doing electron microscopy, is hugely expensive. So that's a test that would cost $850 to be done, and she, it will be done free of charge if people can get their samples. I thought it was only going to be open to AKC, registered dogs, but I, I emailed her prior to coming here and she will, any dog with a pedigree is acceptable in terms of that study. Um, and just, just in case you thought it was all doom and gloom and everything was really bad, I've got a colleague that I work with in genetics and she's looking at the boxer dogs, but she's using boxers as her control population because they don't get diabetes. So I just thought I'd end up in some <laughs> good news for you. And uh, boxes are very underrepresented in the diabetes study. So if anybody's interested, 
this is the link to they've got a website they've got a facebook page and they're they're studying diabetes but they're the boxers of the good guys <laughs> um so i obviously not a boxer this is my own dog who had the temerity to die of kidney disease although he was 18 and a half at the time <laughs> We prefer to take questions after the three speakers have spoken, particularly some of your questions might be covered by mm. what's coming. So yep. try and hold those in your head. But thank you, Hattie.